thank you, and good morning. Can you imagine being born without eyes and be able to see? Being born without ears and being able to hear? Being born without a tongue and being able to talk? Well, I'm going to tell you the story as soon as they give me the clicker. <laughs> of Kelly Rogers. Kelly Rogers is my research assistant. She's my co-author. And by the way, she's my hero. The story starts in 1986. I was working at Western Medical Center, and I received a phone call from her mother. And her mother wanted to know if I would do an assessment of her daughter for a mandibular advancement, a jaw advancement. She said her daughter was born with congenital aglossia, which I wrote down because I'd never heard of it. And she said that everything was fine. She spoke, she swallowed, but that she had a small jaw. Well, I asked her to tell me more about Kelly. She said when her daughter was born, the only suggestion that was made to her was that she use a long nipple with an enlarged opening at the end to help her swallow. And she said she was told that Kelly would never speak or swallow normally. She said she did, and she did just fine, and she reached all her milestones in speech and swallowing, and she never had any surgical intervention. She never had any medical assistance. She never had any speech therapy. I said, she never had any speech therapy? No, she never had any speech therapy. Well, I was intrigued. I told her mother that I'd like to look into it a little bit, but I would make an appointment for the following week, which I did. And in the meantime, I looked up congenital aglossia in the literature, and I found out that there'd only been seven cases identified in 300 years. Seven cases since 1718. And all these cases were anecdotal stories. None of them had any kind of research or scientific basis. Oh, my gosh. Okay, couldn't wait to meet her. So time came for the speech evaluation. I went into the waiting room, and I said, is Kelly Rogers here? And this very attractive woman stood up and said, I'm Kelly Rogers. Are you Dr. McMicken? And I thought, oh. She, she absolutely could not be absent tongue. I can't imagine. This is amazing. I brought her into my room, and we talked for about 20 minutes. And gosh, she was a perfectly normal teenager. She was in high school. She was getting great grades. She had an active social life. She reported no problems with speech or swallowing. I asked after about 20 minutes to look in her mouth, and I looked in, and there was nothing there. There were teeth and the floor of her mouth, but there was no tongue. I, I was absolutely overwhelmed. How could she have been sitting here talking to me and not have a tongue? So I told her that I would like to speak to the physicians at the Center for Disorders of Head and Neck, and that we would talk about how we could go on with her assessment. This is not keeping up with me. Okay, so I spoke to them, and frankly, they thought that I was hallucinating. They thought this couldn't be. We've never heard of anything like this. But they suggested getting extensive audiovisual recordings and getting Cine radiographic studies, which are x-ray movies of her when she is speaking. And let's try to figure out what you're talking about. Okay. So we brought What time do you have? Here she is. What time do you have? Ida did it. Ida did it. I might type it today. I might type it today. Dave dove deeply. Dave. So that was Kelly at the age of 16. And as you can hear, she spoke beautifully, even under construction at Western Medical Center, all that banging and hammering. 
We did cine radiographic studies, and I'm showing you a couple of frames here. You'll see that the red line is the floor of her mouth. The white line is the base of tongue. We all have this. We have a floor of our mouth. We have a base of tongue. But we have a regular tongue sitting on top of that. She does not. But look what happens when she speaks. This remarkable movement takes place. And not only does the movement take place as you see it, but those structures act independently. They act in symmetry. They act so that they can move forward and backward. Amazing. So the compensations that Kelly is making are absolutely extraordinary. Our physicians said they would never recommend surgery on her because she speaks and she swallows beautifully. Why would you interrupt this? So we lost track of Kelly. She went back to high school, and we studied these films for a long time, and we wrote for the next decade and published papers, and we gave lectures for the next decade over what we learned from Kelly because the physicians were reconstructing the oral cavity after surgery, and they reconstructed differently and with better functional results based on what we learned from Kelly. It was wonderful. Okay, so let's talk about their recommendations. Of course, the recommendations were for no help, no assistance from us. Go on about your life. I came here to Cal State Long Beach in 2006, and I took a position as an assistant professor back on a tenure track, had to do research. And I remembered the tapes I had on Kelly from 1986. Recruited students, recruited other researchers, and we began to research that material. We looked at acoustics, we looked at perceptual, we looked at physiologic, uh, physio excuse me, physiologic. Acoustic meaning we studied the sounds that she was making. Perceptual, meaning could you all understand her? And physiology, how was she making those sounds? The conclusions of our research was that literally everyone could understand about 80% of all the sounds that she made. Her acoustics were very similar to the speech and the acoustics in a normal per person, a person with a tongue. But the physiology, we could not understand how she was making these sounds. We tried, but we couldn't figure it out. As an example, T and D, ta and da. When you do it, you go, t you put your tongue tip behind your upper teeth. She doesn't have a tongue. She doesn't have a tongue tip. She can't do that. How is she doing it? So we moved forward trying to find out, but we weren't able to do it with the 1986 research. Oh, my gosh. In 2012, I got a phone call. Kelly had read an article that appeared in the Long Beach Press-Telegram, and it was about our research that we were doing here at the university, and she wanted to get back together. Well, I couldn't wait. So she came to the university. We spent an entire day together, and by the end of the day, I had hired her as my assistant, my co-researcher, and my co-author. That was one of the happiest days of my life. When Kelly came back in my life, I contacted a researcher in Brazil and one in Germany, because there had been two additional studies in the research. So now there were nine studies. The one in Brazil said, come on to Brazil. Let's do a conference on congenital aglossia. You and Kelly, we'd love you to come. You can be our keynote speakers. We accepted, but a month before the conference, I ended up with kidney cancer. They took out my kidney, and I couldn't go. And I said, Kelly, can you go? Can you be the keynote speaker? Can you present my speech? And she agreed. She did a fabulous job. Fabulous. 
and she met the only other person that we had identified at the time with congenital agraphia in Brazil. This woman had had five years of surgery on her jaw and her oral cavity in order to speak and swallow. But this was the only person with congenital agraphia Kelly had ever met. Very emotional week for her, but a wonderful week. After Kelly came back, we said, let's go ahead. Let's try to figure out that question. How do you talk? How do you speak? I don't understand it. You don't understand it. And particularly, how do you make a T and a D? I can't figure it out. So we did electropalatography and video fluorography. Electropalatography is where we had a retainer made for Kelly with electrodes in it. And when whatever was in her mouth elevated and contacted it, you could see it on the retainer. So we knew that when she made a T and a D, a ta and a da, she was making contact with something in the front of her mouth with that retainer. We could tell that, but we still didn't know what the structures were. We did video fluoroscopy. And in doing the video fluoroscopy, we looked at ta-ta-ta and da-da-da. Let's hear ta-ta-ta. Ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta. And let's hear da-da-da. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Gosh, she can do it, right? And you can tell the difference, but we still don't know how she's doing it. So, okay, we have all these film frames and 1,300 of them. We graphed all the muscle movement and all the bone movement in 1,300 film frames and by hand and then traced that. And we were able to come up with these wonderful graphs. Now, if you look at that red circle, you will see that when she says da, 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 the lower lip is making the most movement of any of the other muscles and bones in her mouth. But the other ones are moving. So we know who's moving the most, but we're not sure yet exactly how she's doing it. Well, in the summer of 2015, I got a phone call, one of those phone calls you never forget, from two researchers at USC in the linguistics department, and they had all this money, and they were doing MRIs on people with normal speech and people that had had some kind of difference in their oral cavity. They said, would you like to come on board and have an MRI done? Well, we jumped all over that. And here you see an MRI of Kelly on your left and someone with a tongue on the right. Let's play the one on the right. We wish to know all left. about my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Well, he is nearly 93 years old, yet he still That's thinks Kelly. as swiftly as ever. Okay, so you can see in Kelly's mouth, the mylohyoid, which is the floor of the mouth, that's a big muscle that she has really worked on, and you can see the base of tongue behind it. Those are the two structures she's moving the most. Now let's see the other one. You wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he is nearly 93 years old, yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. That's what you and I do. That's a piece of cake, right? What she does is tough, is hard. Okay, so we know what contextual speech looks like. Let's take a look at her oral cavity now that the USC folks with these incredible algorithms have outlined it, and they can actually make it move. So would you play that, please? Uh -huh. That's the person with a tongue. And the other? Uh -huh. That's Kelly. Watch it again. Uh -huh. oh, did you see it? Let's play this one. There's no sound. And the other. Oh my gosh. So what the people up at USC can do is measure all of those red lines and tell you ex the exact point of constriction with the sound. They line it up with the sound. So we knew finally how she makes a T and a D.
she makes it with her lips. You and I, she makes it with her heart. Oh my gosh, what a relief. Let's meet that person that is making all of those sounds. Kelly, would you please come up? <laughs> Have you always been this tall? I think you've just been short. I think I'm getting shorter. Maybe. Boy. <laughs> okay, this is Kelly Rogers. This is the ma amazing Kelly Rogers. But, you know, I've asked her to do an awful lot of things for the last many years. <laughs> Has that been hard for you? Um, it, it was an adjustment. I was always reluctant to talk about having congenital glossia, so I had to learn to embrace it and be open about it, but it's been a positive experience. It's certainly been a positive experience for me. So we have a wonderful continued partnership that's going to be going on and figuring out every single sound she makes and how she makes them. Then we're going to take that information and we're going to help other people that have surgery of the oral cavity, that have differences in their oral cavity. And we can take the information that we're learning from Kelly and we can use it to get speech, clear speech, in those that have this kind of an issue. I'm so excited about the future. Wonderful to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.